Dr. Martin Pham is a, an assistant professor of neurosurgery at UC San Diego, and he's going to teach us uh, more about robotic surgery. So go, go and take it away, Martin. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Dr. Rowe. I appreciate that. Um, so again, uh, my name is Martin Pham, and I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery at UC San Diego. And I have with me Dr. Ben Schell, phenomenal uh, fellow uh, for this year at the Seattle Science Foundation. Kianaka, uh, Kianaka Schmidt is going to be my scrub, and then Sarah Harper in the back is going to be running the machine. <laughs> and again, what I'm going to be showing you today is one iteration of an application of navigated spinal robotics. To orient you here as to the setup, this particular uh, navigated spinal robotics platform is attached to the bed. With this, there's actually now an attachment to the patient as well. So this chance pin that you can see here is in the patient's PSIS, and with it is this chance arm that's rigidly attached to the base of the robotics platform. So you have the rigidity of the platform attached to the bed, and there's actually a physical connection of the arm to the patient's skeleton and the patient's spine. Now, once that's done, a surface scan is done, and if you actually look on the software screen, the the robotic arm itself, this particular arm, has two optical cameras that you can see in the forearm. Five pictures are taken of the surface, and then, a, as you can see, a finite element model is then created so that the robotic arm understands where the surface of the patient is. This allows the software to essentially calculate the fastest and most efficient movement over the surface of the patient to uh, allow you to put in your pedicle instrumentation. So once that's done, uh, the robotic arm is then registered to the stealth navigation. Can I have the uh, nav probe, please? Uh, just like uh, Bob was saying earlier, the arm itself knows its position in space throughout the six joints. And through this, just like proprioception, it understands where it is in three-dimensional space. The stealth navigation system now is told where the arm is. And so once this arm is in a set position, the arm holds something called a snapshot tracker, the stealth eyes then take that picture. And so now the stealth understands and can see where the arm is so that you as a surgeon can see this depth. And as you can see, this nav probe shows that. There's a divot on here to confirm the accuracy. And when you put that on the divot, you can see here as well the uh, accurate representation of what the stealth station knows of where the arm is. Now, once this uh, navigation is registered, Two, uh, essentially just two fluoroscopy shots are taken, an AP shot and an oblique shot. The usual workflow for navigated spinal robotics is that most patients, I would say 95% of them, get a preoperative CT scan. Um, you can get an intraoperative CT uh, if you like, but a pre-op CT is usually the most efficient workflow. The pre-op CT is then segmented out per level. So each vertebral body is understood as a brick in three-dimensional space. When the patient is positioned either prone or even lateral or any position you want, the AP and lateral fluoroscopy is then registered to the pre-op CT. And as you can see here, that segmental fluoroscopy is then registered to the pre-op CT. So the software understands now where the spine is in situ in the operating room. Now, our eyes can detect about 256 grayscale, so when we look at a fluoro shot, it all looks mostly the same. The software sees 65 million grayscales. So each level to the software and to the robotic arm is very distinct and vivid, and this is how it's able to register each level that you do with a very high degree of accuracy. You can see on the software, those check marks on the left show that the registration is less than a millimeter. If it's yellow, it's one to two millimeters, and if it's greater than two millimeters off, the um, arm will not allow you to proceed uh, as that check. Now, once that's done, uh, the arm can then be sent to the first position, and you can start putting in your instrumentation. So uh, this is the plan. We can load that up. So Martin, you've already done the plan then, right? Correct. So, so I'm actually going to show you the exact plan that I did. So um, from the workflow standpoint, are you doing this like on the day of surgery or the night before surgery? Typically, I do this the night before surgery. So you can see the plan there, and I'm actually going to go and step over. Um, Dr. Shell, if you can stay here and be my Vanna White and keep everything <laughs> looking good. So this plan here, and uh, Kianika can, can attest, this plan I actually made yesterday here in the lab. It took me quite literally about four minutes to do, right? 
Each level I put in, and you can see I can scroll through each level, starting point and trajectory, on axial, sagittal, and coronal, right? And Martin, the thing is, is hey Martin, we, can you do this at home? Is there a platform where you, you can actually plan this at home? Do you that have is, to be at the hospital? That is correct. So this software can be uh, installed on any computer that you like. I have it installed on my home desktop and my work computer in the office. And so I can do it in, you know, uh, in any location that I like. Again, the benefit of this is you can see how, especially for MIS surgery, which we're talking about, all of this can be planned. You can see the trajectories up front. You can see all these towers up front, and the rod is lined up exactly as how I want it to be lined. And I can even see at the skin incisions to make sure that although these screws are... Uh, they're aligned so that they're appropriate, the incisions are clustered together, and that everything is essentially optimized for what we're talking about today at the symposium is uh, MIS surgery. Can right? you go back to that skin incision? What, what do you mean by like planning the skin incision? So for example, um, if I go to the skin level here, right? This skin incision, if I were to go to uh, L2, right, and I go to the sagittal, you see how this trajectory is optimized to start low and to go high to bring the skin incision down. Huh. Now, if I were to, example, bring this, uh, bring this up, you can see in real time that skin incision is moving. You see now it's way up here. Oh, so the, so the, the, the dots on the outside lateral to the rods, those are the skin incisions? Then? That is correct. Interesting. Right? So when you're doing a percutaneous case, if you're doing, you see how, you know, four, five, and one, the skin incisions can be clustered together. Uh, if you like, to minimize your exposure on your skin. And so this can be predicted up front. And you can see if you're doing a multi-level minimally invasive surgery, all this is lined up, not just for the skin, obviously, but for your actual rod, which essentially can be the hard, one of the hardest parts of the case. Right? This is all, and this is what one of the benefits, I think, of robotics is, is that all of this, as I was telling Ben, all of this is what we want to do. When we're doing minimally invasive surgery, multi-level surgery, whether it's floral or nav assist, um, this is the construct that we have in our minds. And the benefit of the Navigated Spinal Robotics platform is that it allows you to accomplish this surgical goal that we all have in mind. Um, if you go ahead and send to the uh, left S1, but the, the, back to the skin incision, that, that's an approximation, right? So the, the robotic hand will get down to that area, but it, the, the incision, you're making the incision yourself. Correct. That is an approximation based off of the CT scan, which can see the skin. However, as you can see, with this robotic arm here, this skin incision, as I put this down, right, this is essentially where that skin prediction is detecting on the patient's skin, right? So, I mean, the CT is a supine CT. The patient is prone now, so it is an estimation. And again, when you make your skin incision, the skin can be moved uh, however which way you want. But it's helpful to know, especially if your towers may collide or not, um, or how far away your skin incisions are, or if you're doing something like a long construct and you're way up on the most proximal level, and that is exceeding what your exposure is gonna be. So it allows that extra degree of information for planning purposes. Is this related, you know, because this platform, I think, also scans the surface, right? So is it based on that surface scan? It is not. The, the surface scan that you saw earlier is purely from a safety standpoint, so that the robotic arm doesn't collide with the patient, and that it can maximize its movements to maximize its efficiency. Got it, thank you. Of course. So with regards to the workflow, this is being sent to the left um, S1. You can see this is the guidance. Everything goes down the arm. And one of the things that I usually say first is that everything should be coaxial down to this arm. The first step is making that incision, so, which is what I'm making right now. And again, the incision is made. I drag the skin to make room for the towers caudally. And then I drag it cranially. Once that's done, the skin goes all the way through the fascia and all the way down to the bone. Right. This, what you see next, is the navigated dilator and the cannula, right? So the navigated dilator goes down, and the cannula slides over it. And you can see here, with the navigation, you can see as a surgeon where you're going. That plan 
uh, is what I planned earlier that I showed you on the software. And this navigated dilator is perfectly coaxial to that plan. So again, the benefits of the navigated robotics platform is that it's not like navigation where you have to be on trajectory all the time. The arm sets you in that trajectory. And just like Bob was saying earlier, the navigation in this particular solution is redundant. It's so that you can see, especially in a, in a minimally invasive application, what you're doing. So we can confirm that we're on the plan. The next steps are the drill guide, and this is the anti-sky pin. Again, for certain applications where the facet joint can potentially be a bit steep, this anti-sky pin, I'm gonna move my hands here, you can see, this goes down the trajectory. This is the tamp, so you drive down the drill guide onto the bone. The anti-sky pin is then removed, and then you drill down this drill guide. The drill is also navigated. It has a positive stop at 30. And you can see here, as I'll demonstrate, right, perfectly down trajectory. Again, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, the navigation is a check. Right? So if the navigation looks off, it's not like doing your standard navigation where you have to make the picture look pretty. The arm itself, as determined by engineers, is, is essentially accurate to within a quarter millimeter. Right? So as you go here, if the navigation looks a little bit off, it's just because of the deflection of the um, beads in the frame. When these drills were first made, they were made without navigation, so there is some flex in the drill that was built in so that the drill bounces off the medial cortex. There are newer drills being made now that are stiffer for the stealth itself. Here's the tap. There is no positive stop on the tap, so this actually is navigated. Again, perfectly coaxial to my plan. And since it's S1, I'm going to go pretty much to the tip here. So can you feel that if it's going bicortical? Correct. So you can feel it. The, the, there is a haptic feedback. And I know there's some concern with surgeons that when you use robotics and when you use power, there's a loss of haptic feedback. The feedback is there. It's just different and more subtle. And as you can see, especially with this platform, I do everything on power. And as uh, Jeff, we discussed actually the other night, with power, there is a smooth delivery of force. Right, so as you can see here, as I'm putting down the screw, there's a very, very smooth delivery of force perfectly down this plan. And instead of doing everything by hand where you're constantly turning and rocking down your path and prepared track and the arm itself, here it's just a smooth delivery of the screw down exactly where I wanted it to go. How, how accurate is the tip? on the monitor relative to the tip in real life? Uh, let me see, how accurate is the tip? Well, I mean, I can confirm, so the accuracy of the tip is dependent upon the accuracy of the navigation, correct? So this, um, this tip as portrayed on the stealth is based off of the stealth's understanding of where the objects are in three-dimensional space. So we can check that. If you're ever unsure, can I have the nav pro, please? You can take the nav probe to check the accuracy of your navigation. And again, you can see here, uh, let, me, let me actually do this divot so we can see it. Can we show the, uh, oh, there we go. And can you zoom in please on that? So you can see it's, it's accurate. I would say as described, less than a millimeter accurate. Mm. And again, if the stealth is not accurate, if your image is not accurate, then it's just because the stealth is not understanding where the arm is. This robotics platform doesn't depend on stealth, right? I'm sorry, it doesn't depend on navigation. The navigation itself is a second check. And so if things are not looking as they should, the best analogy I can think of is like, if you put an object in front of you on a table and then you cross your eyes, it's not like you have two objects, right? It's just because your eyes aren't understanding where the things are in three-dimensional space. This arm is the same way. The, the robotics platform understands where everything is based off of the proprioception of all six joints and is guiding you down to place that screw. What you see is a very, very pretty picture of a representation of where the screw is 
in three-dimensional space. And again, if you're ever unsure, you can always double check to see what that registration is. And again, very accurate. So to answer your question, how accurate is the tip? It's this accurate, according down to the plan. Okay, can, Got it. Can we go ahead and send to left L5? So I'm gonna have Ben, Dr. Shell here show you sort of that uh, workflow as well. I'm gonna move this out of the way. So again, the knife goes down, cranial caudal. Mm -hmm. Can I try to connect on? Yep, go ahead and retract just to open up your incision. And it's a sawing motion up and down. Good. And then now I'll go ahead and slide the knife all the way down to the bone itself. And all you did was just instruct um, the representative to put it on the, the L5 screw, correct? Correct. I, I had her send the trajectory to the uh, L5 trajectory screw. And there's a foot pedal, isn't there? There is no foot pedal on this one. So unlike the other applications, um, this is automatically sent. Got it. Go ahead and slide the cannula down, it's sort of a twisting motion. Ooh. So you see how, so when you see this haptic feedback, that is essentially the arm telling you that you're pushing too hard <laughs> against the arm. So the motion here, sliding just like this, right? So you're dilating the muscle as you go down. Gotcha. Okay. You can check again on your navigation screen to make sure you're on trajectory. So the arm itself is perfectly going down your planned path. Here's the drill guide with the anti-sky pin. Go ahead and slide that down and gently mallet that anti-sky pin down. All right, nice, easy taps. Good. And now place this tamp over the pin. And now you're tamping down the drill guide to seat the drill guide against the bone. Nice, easy taps. Good. Along the side here. Perfect. And now here's the drill. As I was telling Ben, a lot of these instruments are fairly long. Um, and so I always just remind um, operators that when you move these instruments to move at the center of the instrument so that you don't accidentally strike, gosh, the robot or your assistant. Mm -hmm. And here's just all the way, uh, here you can go as fast as you like, because it's just a drill. And again, you're breaking through hard bone. Again, it may look off on the navigation screen so I can make it look prettier. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the drill itself and the arm itself is guiding you down. That's got a positive stuff. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And go ahead and remove the drill guide. Next step is the tap. The tap has no positive stop. And so here is where the navigation is helpful because you can see exactly how far you're tapping. You don't have to tap all the time, do you? Correct, you don't. And so this is for folks who, who like to tap. There are certain manufacturers that make um, screws where you don't need to tap. Good, keep going. Good, now stop and go ahead and put in reverse. Perfect. Great. And now go and remove the cannula. Twisting motion, perfect. And then here's going to be your screw, 6, 5 by 45. Again, all of these screws were determined beforehand, personalized, and based upon the patient's CT anatomy. So all this has already been decided. And you can see here, so Ben has never, ever done this before, right? The workflow is different, but you can see how with the assistance of Navigated Spinal Robotics, the ability to place pedicle screw instrumentation becomes that much more accurate, precise and reproducible. It's on reverse. Oh, you're on forward, thanks. Uh, more accurate, precise, and reproducible, and is much more easily taught with regards to a learning curve. Just like Bob said in his really great uh, robotics presentation, there's not much of a learning curve when you have this particular tool at your disposal. Great, keep going. Perfect, go ahead and stop there. Yeah, and then uh, go ahead and release the gold ring. And so there was a screw, right? So it took, gosh, like one minute, two minutes for the first time screw placement. You can imagine once you've been doing this for quite some time, the workflow of this becomes very straightforward um, and very easy. Go ahead and send it to the left L4. 
and you go ahead and do this level. So the, the analogy that I like to make, mm -hmm. and you know, we, we had been talking about this earlier, um, you know, to some extent, placing pedicle screw instrumentation, there is an emotional attachment to it, right? Obviously, all of us as spine surgeons love putting in implants when it's appropriate, when it's indicated. Putting in pedicle screw instrumentation is just like driving, right? Everyone loves to drive. There's an emotional attachment to holding on to the steering wheel, to pushing down the pedal, to taking that curve. Just like with putting in pedicle screws, like most of us were trained either freehand or floor assist or even navigated assistance, there's an emotional attachment to putting down the pedicle probe and driving in all those tools. This is a different way of doing it and there is some release of that direction. Hmm? Okay. Uh, oh, I, I see. Take the next back. Right. And so with this, the, the robotics platform is automating a part of that process. But it doesn't change the responsibility of the surgeon. The robotics platform is still doing it according to my plan. It's doing it to my vision of what I wanted in terms of the construct for this patient. And so there is a bit of that letting go in allowing the arm to take me to where I want to go. So again, instead of driving, it's sort of like setting your car on autopilot, right? I'm, I'm still in the driver's seat. My hands are still on or near the steering wheel, and I'm still watching where everything is going. But it's the car now that is still taking me from destination A to destination B. And again, you can see the workflow here, anti-skive pin, then putting down the drill guide on the actual bony anatomy itself to seat the drill guide. Anti-skive pin then comes out. Here's the drill. And the other thing that I'd like to point out, and this is something that I, I talk about a lot in many of my planning presentations, is that one of the potential benefits of these types of robotic platforms is that it takes away the potential troubleshooting of other methods, go and take out the drill guide, the other potential methods of putting in instrumentation. So whether you do it freehand, floor assist, whether you do it with navigation with an intraoperative CT, every method is gonna have some element of potential troubleshooting if things don't go perfectly, right? And no matter how good of a surgeon all of us are, there's always potentially some element where you have to figure out what might be going wrong. One of the benefits here is that, okay, going in reverse, is that that is potentially minimized, right? So it's not like I'm looking at the C-arm and having them boost it because I can't see because the patient's too large. It's not because I can't see the x-ray that well. It's not because I bumped the nav frame where I need to re-spin. There's much less of that troubleshooting because of the reliability of this platform solution. Great. And as you can see here already, as I've been talking all your ears off, uh, Ben has already put in two pedicle screws perfectly down the plan without um, uh, minimal but appropriate supervision on, uh, on my end. So. <laughs> Nice work, Ben. Yeah. Thanks, sir. I, I can attest that you, you chose a great candidate, obviously, for, uh, for this year. If I keep going a little bit more, there's, there's more torque to the driver. Jinxed it. Yeah. So can you take a look Perfect. at the depth of each screw now, like it, comparatively? I'm sorry, say again? Can you compare the depth of each of the screws comparatively, where they are relative to each other? Uh, yes, you can. Um, so as you can see, all of the screws went down their plan. And so when I load up my plan, the depth of the screws is also pre-planned. So when you pull up the sagittal, that is actually dialed in up yeah, front. Yeah, but remember, like, it, it was Ben who was controlling the depth, right? So meaning that this is your plan, but I want to know right now, based on the screws that he just placed, where it really is anatomically in relative right. to each other. So the only way to do that technically is by taking a lateral floor shot. Interesting. Yeah. And so, I mean, everything is, is navigated. Everything is in the patient right now. I can put the nav probe down, mm -hmm. I guess, and that's one way to check. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
Go ahead and clear, I guess you can clear the arm up. Sure. And again, as we confirmed, um, the navigation is accurate based on the divot of the arm, so the navigation itself is accurate. So, so I guess my question is this, so you know like navigation systems, when you, when you place a screw, you can put, place a virtual screw once it's in? You Correct. know what I'm saying? Are you able to do, I'm assuming that you can still do it with this system though, right? Uh, what do you mean by placing a virtual screw? Like, once your screw is in, it, it locks down exactly where it is on, in the spine. Correct, correct. So, I mean, so you can do that. Yes, I mean, so once the, I guess, the solution here is a little bit different. Once the screw is down, as you can see, the plan is still in place, but it doesn't put down a virtual screw for you. The live image you saw before of that pink screw is a live image image of a virtual screw in three-dimensional space as you use it based off of the instrument, right? Got it. But there's no need to leave the screw in place. I mean, you could dial it in as a software plan, but you already know the screw is down. You already know that the live image was overlapping with this plan, so cognitively, you know the screw is down there, and this is, again, where it's down. Great. Um, in terms of the, the height of it, you can always shoot a fluoro to check. But any navigation system is just overlaying a picture over where you believe the screw to be anyway. Got it. Hey, Martin, thank you so much. We're running a little bit behind. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to come back here to the, um, to the conference area. Of course. And we're going to do, um, do a quick panel with you and, and, and Bob for Q&A. Okay, great. I'll be right, right on over. Nice work. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.